Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's something that I've observed in um, some of the circles around climate change and um, environmental activism or just concerns about any of these things is I feel like one of the first kind of reactions that I that I tend to observe when people become aware of how bad it really is ecologically right. and climatologically on the planet is like they tend to extend the shittiness of, say, industrial societies right. and how they've treated the environment to everything and everybody. Right. So it's like humanity itself is right. shit and a virus and a plague and needs to, you know, in, the earth would be better without all of us. And I... And I know they're not necessarily talking about any particular group of people, but I, I became aware that the reason why I felt so uncomfortable with that framing and that narrative is I think it opens up um, space for right-wing narratives to come in. It's too easy for them to just come in and say, yeah, well, you're right. Mm -hmm. And there's a particular group of people that are threatening uh, or, or are, are more responsible for that and um, and I've always just felt like there's there's all of these openings that uh, what I would consider maybe more leftist or, or liberal minded folks, they don't realize what they're doing. They don't realize what they're really giving space for. And right. I think we have to really push back against that. And as you address in this in this booklet, you know, we have to really be savvy right. about that. Right. Exactly. Even in Germany, the right wing populist uh, party who has quite a lot of influence in Eastern German states. Uh, one of their um, most influential politicians continues now to talk about overpopulation, in particular about birth rates in Africa and mm -hmm. why it would be ecologically smart for us to close our borders and keep people from Africa coming to Germany. So it's not as if it's far away. These ideas are very much, even in mainstream, like yes, a lot of people know that the AFD is total shit, but at the same time, <laughs> um, these ideas get normalized and they get right. even, I hate to say it, but like in some of the more leftist or anarchist organizing circles that I was a part of in my California days, you know, it was like cool or sexy to like want the collapse to come. And to me, it's kind of like, oh, that means that... To me, that's a reflection of not having a lot of relationship to movements fighting for justice. Right. You know, where those conversations become, it comes, becomes very clear how racist that shit is. Versus like, oh yeah, collapse is romantic and we should welcome it and encourage it. It's like, nope, that's, that's not what's happening here. That's not how change happens. Do you think though there can be a balance there of acknowledging that collapse is this like inevitable process in a society like the U.S., I, I, I personally believe the U.S. is experiencing a collapse and the rise of fascism and, and authoritarianism and right-wing populism and all of this in the, in the U.S. In, the, in particular is, is indicative of a, of a collapsing society or at least a society that's facing very deep crises um, that, we can help, that we can hold the space for understanding that this is an inevitable process. Um, also not wanting it to happen in that sort of romanticized idealistic way where we understand like this isn't something to be celebrating this is something that we just have to take stock of and then prepare for and still have our 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 focus attention to the most vulnerable populations during this process do you know what i mean totally yeah absolutely and to that i would just add like it's a collapse of a belief in a structure of that was normal or okay for some people. And mm. then what has been happening, especially since forever, but really like <laughs> Trump's, Trump's election, these uprisings, right? The veil just keeps getting un, unveiled or peeled back. And exactly what you're saying is like, can we keep an eye on the folks that are most vulnerable, but actually also literally organize our organizations, our campaigns, even our lives around their demands and their visions. Like there are paths forward. There is a declared, you know, other side of transition where justice can exist. And, um, you know, people have been talking about real solutions for a long time. So um, yes, welcoming that change as in like, it's a much needed change. And then let's get a lot more skilled on making sure that we can actually weather that change and looking to the movements who have been talking about that shit for a long time. Yeah. 
Well, the third point in the three things every climate activist needs to know is the far right does not need to govern to influence. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> um, what ways does the far right, because again, I want to really point and highlight to um, the political system in the United States is, is, is different from the European political systems in that here we have just two political parties. And I would argue that you know, both are fairly right wing, just one maybe slightly more than the other at this point. But I mean, they're they're really quite far right at this point, the Republican Party in particular. Um, but in Europe, it's not that cut and dry. There's quite a few, there's quite a variety of political parties, so there is a there is a context there. But um, but anyway, I would just ask, you know, in maybe both contexts, but uh, maybe where you're at in Germany and in Europe, um, how does the far right? Uh, influence the discussion around climate activism, even when they're not in a position of, of being in the parliament or in the government of these countries. Absolutely. Yeah. One thing that I tried to bring out in the booklet is it really matters where you are, right? Like if you are in Hungary and also in Poland in various ways, like the leading party, the ruling party and the opposition party are quite far right parties. So like you're, that is the general milieu and um, more progressive or even liberal or left organizations and um, movements are in a much different position. Whereas in Germany, right, like um, AFD does have influence in some states and in general, there's a, you know, unspoken but well-known agreement amongst parties like we will not build coalitions with you for mm -hmm. various reasons. So, I mean, it's quite mixed wherever you go. But what I like to point out in the UK is that um, UKIP, which was now mostly a defunct um, parliamentary party, but Ni Nigel Farage um, a few years ago was a big part of bringing climate denialism back into parliamentary politics. So they weren't even in parliament they were gathering political um, attention. They were pushing from the outside and uh, kind of like declaring what they wanted for a more nationalist agenda inside parliament. And they didn't have a lot of political influence and they, their actual ability to participate in parliament was kind of been on the decline for a long time, but, but they raised issues and they stoked enough uh, conversations and agitations and lots of anger around, um, you know, like border protections and nativism, basically, that that then propelled the conversation, like people who were then in parliament were forced to take on these more far right ideas about the government, or not the government, but, the, but climate and like positions on climate. So I say that to emphasize that, you know, you don't have to be even in the ruling coalition, like you could be in parliament, you could be outside of parliament or in the German context, right? There's a think tank called ICA. So they are not even a political, you know, practicing party in that way, but they have a lot of connections to different politicians in the AFD, in the CDU, in different parties actually. And their whole agenda is to produce enough denialism to support basically, um, you know, a reliance on the auto industry, but also um, undermining climate science and undermining people who are very proactive around climate. So, you know, it could be think tanks, it could be par uh, parties who don't have a lot of influence. There's a, quite a few different ways in which influence can happen. And it mm -hmm. also depends on the political moment. You know, after the uh, Eurobarometer um, survey came out in 2019 and it was shown like across Europe very widely also in countries that you know um, not are not typically known for like climate support <laughs> like Poland <laughs> so coal oriented um, it actually showed that you know people who are willing to participate in the survey you know up in the 90s 90 percent where populations in these countries like interest and 
uh, desire for the government or for the nation to do something about climate has kept rising over the last years. And so what this indicates, right, is like kind of across the board, European society cares about climate in a way that is growing and people are trying to take action or make sense of it in their everyday lives. And at the same time, <laughs> there's more far right and right wing populist politicians in parliament. So with these two pieces, as well as like all these student movements, Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, you know, mass actions, these pieces together, it seems like climate and environment, like a, a plausible guess is that this will be continued to be like a galvanizing issue. And mm -hmm. so we need to be really aware of how these different influences take place at different levels.